Welcome. My name is Mike Runge. I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey at the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center. And today I'd like to make a presentation that talks about game theory in the context of structured decision making. This is part of a series of lectures um, that's part of the advanced practicum in structured decision making offered by the National Conservation Training Center. This is part of a larger curriculum on structured decision making that's offered at, the, uh, at NCTC. So today I want to talk about game theory. This is, this is quite a bit of a departure from the usual conversations that we have in structured decision making. And, and to motivate this, let, let's look at an example of a multi-criteria decision analysis that, we, that might be typical of a conservation setting. And let's use that to think about how maybe the tools that we often have in multi-criteria decision analysis aren't the full set of tools that we want. So let's take a look at a multi-criteria decision analysis that we, might, that we might be faced with. Let's imagine we've got two objectives, objective one and objective two. It doesn't matter what they are. Uh, but if you want, you could think of one of them as a conservation objective and another of them as a development objective, let's say. And let's say we've got four actions that are possible, A, B, C, or D. And let's say we've worked through, we've worked through the, the consequence table. We've made predictions about these different actions in the terms of these different objectives. And we've normalized them to a 0, 1 scale. So we're looking at the normalized consequence table. And so what this says is if, if we take action A, our return is 60% of as good it could be uh, under objective 1 and under objective 2. But under action B, we fully achieve objective 1, but we fail to achieve, or we do the worst we, we can on objective 2. Uh, that's switched in, in alternative C. And then alternative D is a case where we do poorly on both objectives. So how would we solve this problem? Well, we would solve this problem normally by saying, well, let's put some weight on these objectives, right? We'll put, uh, we'll put a weight W. Doesn't, I'll, I'm going to use variables because I want to be able to solve this generally here. But we can put a weight W on objective 1, and therefore the weight on objective 2 is 1 minus W. And so we would say that, well, we'll take the expected value across these objectives. We'll take the expected value then. The expected value of 0.6 times W plus 0.6 times 1 minus W, the expected value is 0.6, right? It doesn't matter what the weight is. The, the average of those is going to be 0.6. Likewise, the expected value will be 0.2 uh, for alternative D, where the outcomes don't differ across objectives. The, what, is the, what is the expected value for action B? Well, it's 1 times W plus 0 times 1 minus W. So that's, uh, that's W. And the, uh, the expected value is 1 minus w for alternative c. So which action do we choose? Which action do we choose? Depends on w, right? It depends on the weight that we want to place on these objectives. And so, so we would then go through the kind of processes we're familiar with, like uh, swing weighting or other alternatives, to elicit these weights on these objectives from the decision maker or for, from the, uh, the group of decision makers that are involved. And, if, and it turns out that if we solve this, if we solve this, uh, what, um, what range of values favor alternative A? I mean, alternative A looks like a pretty good alternative, right? I mean, if we were thinking about this as some competing objectives, we would say A looks like a pretty good compromise solution. Right? Because, uh, OK, objective one doesn't get everything it wants. Objective two doesn't get everything it wants. But they both do better than, than 50%. Right? So you, maybe this is a, an acceptable compromise solution. In fact, it is an acceptable compromise solution if w is between 0.4 and 0.6. If that's the case, then, then a will have a higher expected value than b or c. And of course, it has a higher expected value than d. A couple things to note here. One is, if we looked at the problem this way, nobody, well, it'd be hard to argue for alternative D. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. We don't do well on either objective. Certainly, A dominates D if we're looking at the problem this way. There's a little bit of funniness here, though, because 
if the, if the weight on uh, w, if the weight on objective 1 is greater than 0.6, we would favor b. If it's greater, if it's less than 0.4, we would favor c. And if it's between those, we'll favor a. OK, well, that's, that's fine. We could, we could use this sort of method. And then what it comes down to, this is, we've essentially done the sensitivity analysis to the weights here, right? And so the, what it comes down to is, well, what's the weight? And, and, and that will lead us to either A, B, or C. But D would never, it's not likely to be chosen. Well, it wouldn't be chosen. Well, let's put another twist on this. One of the assumptions here is that there's a single decision maker who's willing to put weights on these. Or there's a collective body of decision makers that are willing to agree to a weight. But think about this from another perspective. What if these are two competing decision makers? Obje one decision maker has objective one. The other decision maker has objective two. This gives you some sense of where the common ground is. But if they're independent decision makers, they're autonomous decision makers, they're not obliged to compromise. They're not obliged to give up 40% of their performance in deference to 60% performance of their competitor. And so if one of the decision makers has a weight greater than 0 0.6 and the other has a weight greater than less than 0.4 on objective 1, then <clears throat> the, the two decision makers are competing. One would prefer B, one would prefer C. And they're not really willing to compromise about that. And so you reach this impasse, and you have trouble solving the problem. OK, so, so the, the interesting thing here is that what we've done in a multi-criteria decision analysis, indeed in the whole body of work that we refer to as structured decision making, is that we've, made, we've treated these decisions as the decisions of a single agent or single decision maker. And if it's not a single decision maker, then at least it's a group that's agreed to compromise or agreed to make the decision together. Um, and that assumes that we can find some inner group uh, consensus. And that allows us to do this multi-criteria decision analysis. And in those settings, this works well. It works well to understand the structure of the problem and to negotiate and find a solution that's, that's uh, a bet hedging solution in some sense or a compromise solution in another. But in many cir circumstances, the conflicts are irresolvable. I mean, if you, if you think about this, let's talk about some, some historic and current day uh, examples. If you think about objective one is about being about uh, the logging economy, and objective two is about being spotted owls. If you think about objective one as being about wolf recovery, and objective two as being about um, livestock production. Look, you can, you can go through the list. You all know these kind of examples. You face these sorts of things. And in those cases, there may not be a willingness to compromise. It, these, it may be irresolvable, and it may be a false assumption to say that we could seek consensus and use multi-criteria decision analysis. So what do we do in those circumstances? We, at best, try to acknowledge the conflict and try to negotiate around that. Or we appeal to a higher authority to make the decision. But if those steps fail, what, what are we to do? Is there another way? to approach these problems. And so what I want to argue today is that there is, an, there is another body of decision theory known as game theory. And it does not, it's a body of decision theory that talks about what do you do when there are multiple autonomous decision makers who are not obliged to cooperate. How do you make decisions in that setting? Or what, are the, what is the nature of the competitive decisions in that setting? So what I want to do then is walk you through some basic game theory examples. Then I'll talk a little bit about how those relate to conservation problems. Then we'll talk about how you can solve these problems. If you understand them as game theoretic problems, what are some solutions that come out of game theory that might help us in the conservation problems? And um, finally, I'll talk about the value of information in this context. OK, so let's begin with some basic game theory. Let me, um, let me draw the simplest of games for you. Um, it's a simple cooperative game. It'll take me a minute to, uh, to get this on the board. So let's imagine uh, that you've got two players playing a game. And they, they can choose to, we'll say, they each have a choice. They can cooperate or they can defect. This is the language the game theorists use. But you can think of those in, is, in any, any, kind of, uh, any kind of thing. So cooperation choice is the one where, um, you, 
you're agreeing to uh, to do something that's in the interest of of your competitor. It may also be in your interest, and the defect is is the other, is the alternative you have, other alternative you have. So let's uh, let's make a little chart here. Um, there is there's a decision maker two. All right. Who, uh, who can cooperate or defect. And decision maker one has the same choice, can cooperate or defect. Decision maker one. OK. So we've got this two by two sort of description of the game. And in the cells of this game, I'm going to tell you what are the payoffs to each of the individual decision makers? Um, there's not a, net, a joint payoff. There are separate payoffs to each of the decision makers. So in this first game that I want to talk about, let's say the payoff structure, I'll explain what this means. The payoff structure is 2, 2, 1, 1, 1, 1, or 0, 0. And what th this means, you can think of these as, as whatever, the, um, whatever the units that are important to these decision makers are. But, uh, but, what ha but the first number is what decision maker one gets, and the second number is what decision maker two gets. So in this case, if they both cooperate, they each get $2, let's say, or they each get, it um, doesn't matter what the units are, but they get the best they can get if they both cooperate. If one cooperates and the other defects, they each get half of uh, what would be possible. And there's symmetry there. If they both defect, they get nothing. <clears throat> so let's think about the structure of this game. If you were to play this game, you had to make a choice. You didn't know what the other decision maker was going to do. But your payoff, the consequences, depend on what the other decision maker is going to do. What would you choose to do in this game? Cooperate, right? Makes sense to cooperate. There's actually no disincentive in cooperating. Because think about it this way. One of the ways that, that people analyze these, these problems is they say, well, pick a particular cell. If I'm decision maker one and I knew decision maker two was going to, think, say I was thinking of cooperating, and I knew that decision maker two was going to defect. So say I knew decision maker two was going to defect. What would I do? What would be the smartest thing for me to do? Cooperate, right? Even if I know he's going to defect, it's better for me to cooperate. So there's a motivation for decision maker one, if he was thinking about this cell as happening, to go here. And likewise, if decision maker two knows that decision maker one's going to defect, he would switch from defecting to cooperating because it, that's more advantageous than getting the 0, 0. Now, if I was decision maker one, and I thought decision maker two was going to cooperate. I would also cooperate, right? Because I would rather you know, this solution than this solution. And likewise, the, the reverse happens. And so the, the thing is, if you think through this, this problem, the motivation is, the, is to cooperate. It doesn't matter what you think the other person's going to do. Your best bet is to cooperate, OK? And so, there's a couple things we can, we can see out of this. First, um, there, there is what's called a Nash equilibrium. This is an important concept in game theory. The Nash equilibrium is, is the point where no player would unilaterally, unilaterally choose their action knowing the actions of the others. So, if, so this point right here is a Nash equilibrium. I'm going to use the blue for a Nash equilibrium. Okay? So that cell is a Nash equilibrium. The cooperate, cooperate strategy is a Nash equilibrium. Because if you were there and knew you were going to be there, there was no, there's no motivation for either decision maker to change what they would do. That's a stable solution. Okay? It also happens to be, as well, a Pareto optimal solution. And what that means is that there is no other solution in which one decision maker can improve their outcome without the outcome of the other decision maker uh, declining. Let me just re remind the folks online, if you've got any questions throughout this presentation, feel free to email them to ashley 
and her email is shown on the screen right now. And, uh, and then those questions will get passed up and we can answer them. I don't mind the interruptions in the, in the lecture, that's fine, thank you. Um, so we've got, uh, so, the, so the Pareto optimal means there is, there is no solution on this board that's better for decision maker one that isn't worse for decision maker two. In fact, there's actually no solution on this board that's better for decision maker one at all. So it's both Pareto optimum and a Nash equilibrium. That, that makes this a very powerful game. Everybody's motivated to, to cooperate. And incidentally, from the standpoint of the public good, the, the collective good is also achieved at this point. All right, so this is great. I mean, it would be wonderful if all our decisions looked like this. The other thing you might note, if in the language of the structured decision making, this choice dominates all other choices. If we were to put this in a multi-criteria decision analysis, it wouldn't matter the weights on the objectives. Whatever weight you had would lead to this alternative. OK, so that's pretty nice. Unfortunately, and here's the problem, not all games look like that. So let's take a look at um, another game that has a different structure. OK, so. So instead, this is a game that's called Chicken. Um, <clears throat> the, um, you've all played it. You know how it works. The, um, the, the, the payoffs look like this. So let's do the same sort of analysis and think through. So what this says is, this has a more interesting structure, right? If you both cooperate, you, um, yeah, OK, you do all right. If you both defect, you have a terrible outcome. And if one <coughs> cooperates and the other defects, then, then the person that defects gets the higher payoff. OK? The, the reason it's called chicken, um, if you think about, you know the movie Rebel Without a Cause, uh, and, they're, and they're racing their cars um, next to each other. It's uh, called a chicken run, right, a chicky run. Uh, James Dean and Corey, I don't remember the other guy's name. So, uh, so they're racing their cars, and, they, and the first one, to, they're going to drive off, off the cliff. So you've got to jump out of the, you've got to jump out of the car so you don't die. But, um, but you're seeing who's going to jump out first. Well. If you both jump out first early on, it's OK. Everybody lives, right? And, um, and, but there's no, you know, there's no kind of clear winner. If both stay in forever, you know, then they both die. That's not good. Um, if one jumps out, and then the other one will see them jump out and can jump out after them, the person that jumps out first, uh, they, they're cooperating. They lose the game, right? Um, they're alive, but the other guy has, you know, who also can jump out, you know, as after they see the first person jump out, they, they, uh, they win the game. All right, so, so it's interesting motivation. Um, what, uh, what happens if we think about the Nash equilibria? Well, suppose you knew that, suppose you knew that your, um, that decision maker two was going to defect. What would decision maker one do? If you knew that decision maker two was going to defect, it'd be smarter to cooperate, right? Because uh, for decision maker one, because their payoff is one versus zero, OK? If, um, if decision maker one knew that decision maker two was going to cooperate, they would defect. So if you know what the other person's going to do, you're going to do the opposite of it. And so uh, let's see, if, dis if decision maker two knows that decision maker one's going to cooperate, he'll defect. If he knows that decision maker one's going to defect, he'll cooperate. OK. Now, are there Nash equilibrium? Is there a Nash equilibrium? Turns out there are actually two. There's two Nash equilibria. And the reason for this is that decision maker, um, if suppose you were thinking that this was going to be the solution, that uh, your decision maker won, you thought the other guy was going to defect, you, or was going to cooperate, you're going to defect. The um, 
can you improve your outcomes? Would you change your mind and cooperate? Well, no, you wouldn't. So you would not unilaterally change your mind if you knew what the other person was going to do. And likewise, up here, both people um, would, you know, would stick to that, to that strategy. And so you've got two Nash equilibria, but there's no Pareto optimal solution. Uh, there is no, um, if you're here, there's no way for decision maker two to improve his outcome without the outcome of the other person declining. So decision maker two would prefer this over this. So if he's here, he would like to move here. But in order to do that, the other person has to give up. Uh, so there's no Pareto optimal strategy. And, um, and there are two Nash equilibria. All right, so, <clears throat> so what, what happens in this game? I mean, what, what, how, do you, how do you solve this game? Well, the thing is, there's, there's no real answer. The solution is uh, to defect if you know the other party is going to cooperate, and cooperate if the other party is going to defect. Um, this, this game has been studied quite a bit and, um, and is, has been used to describe the nuclear arms race, uh, to describe a lot of kind of brinksmanship sort of situations. Because one of the things you can do here is, is what it just does is motivates a lot of bluster and signaling, right? Because if you're decision maker one, what you want to do is convince, is convince decision maker two that you're going to defect. Because that'll make, if, because if decision maker knew, two knows for sure that you're going to defect, they're going to cooperate. That's the best they can do, right? So, so what you would like to do, you would rationally like to signal to them that you're planning to defect. Because, because that, if, if you're successful in signaling that behavior, that will induce the behavior you want in them, which gives you the highest outcome. Um, so, so you would expect in this kind of situation that if there's any means of communication, that folks are going to, folks are going to bluster. And they're going to, they're going to give this impression in, of, uh, that they're going to defect. Um, in order to induce the behavior they want in you. Okay, so, but, um, but often, you know, uh, you don't know whether that's bluster or that's in fact what they're going to do. So, you know, James Dean needs to convey to his uh, competitor that he's going to stay in the car as long as possible. Because if the competitor knows that, the competitor should just jump out early and save himself, you know, the risk of anything. Um, and then, uh, but, um, but the truth is, decision maker one's not going to defect if they think decision maker two is going to defect, right? So that might be a lot of bluster, but when push comes to shove, James Dean's going to want to jump out of the car, right? Um, yeah. So you know the rest of the story, right? James Dean succeeds in getting the other guy to jump out of his car first, except the other guy seat belt, he gets caught in his seat belt, and he doesn't get out of the car. So James Dean sees him jump, and then James Dean jumps out, but the guy gets caught in the seat belt and goes over the cliff. So anyway, I, maybe that's not a happy story. The, um, okay, let's look at another, another game, that, uh, another classic game that's called, the, the, so that one's called Chicken, I mean, and it's, in the game theory literature, I mean, if you Google chicken uh, and game theory, you'll have you know, just a massive long set of hits that will describe that game in a lot of detail. So I want to describe another one that's called Stag Hunt. So this one's called Stag Hunt. And the payoff matrix looks like this. So What's happening here? There is a, if both members cooperate, then, uh, then they each get a payoff of two. If they both defect, they both get a payoff of one. If one defects and one cooperates, the, co the defector gets the, the reward and the cooperator gets punished. The, uh, the, w the reason it's called a stag hunt is that people are imagining that you're going out uh, with a, a partner to hunt deer, hunt a stag. And the only way you can sex successfully do it is if you work together. So both people have to cooperate. Um, if, they, if one cooperates and the other defects, 
Why might you defect? Well, it might be that you see, you're, you're, way, you're standing in your spot and you see a hare go by, and you could go chase after that hare, catch the hare, and have that for dinner. But um, if you do that, then you're not there to um, either push the stag into the view of the other person or, or what have you. And so if one person defects, then the cooperator doesn't get anything, but the defector gets the hare. If both defect, they both get a hare, they both have something in the pot for dinner, right? So, um, so that's why it's called the stag hunt. So, so what's the, uh, what is the, what do, let's look at for Nash, a Nash equilibrium. First of all, if you knew, if your decision maker won, and you knew that decision maker two was going to defect, what would you do? If you knew they're going to defect, your decision maker one, you're better off defecting also, right? If uh, if, if your partner's going to go chase hair, you might as well chase hair too, all right? If um, if your decision maker two, and you know that decision maker one's going to defect, then you should defect as well, okay? Now, if your decision maker one, and you know that decision maker two is going to cooperate. you're better off cooperating as well, and likewise here. OK, so interestingly, there are, again, two Nash equilibria. But they're in a different place than the last game. There's a Nash equilibrium here, and there's a Nash equilibrium here. And because if, if you were here, if you were thinking that both were going to defect, there's, neither would change their strategy. Neither would change their strategy, uh, because if they did, they would end up in you know, they would, they would give up some, some reward. So, and it turns out there's also a Pareto optimal strategy. And that is, um, that's this one. Wait, so, so it looks like there's really a great, great thing here is uh, let's, let's both cooperate. We'll get, we'll have the stag. We'll, we'll hunt the stag. Um, but there's a funny thing. This is a risky strategy. Because if you pursue this, if you pursue this strategy, because it's an Nash equilibrium and it's uh, Pareto optimal, and I know this is what goes through your head when you're thinking about decisions. Well, is it Nash equilibrium and is it Pareto optimal? Um, the um, the problem is, if there's any risk that the other person is not going to cooperate, then then you face a, a real downside risk. On the other hand, if you choose to defect, defecting is riskless, right? You know that at least you're going to get the one. It doesn't matter to you what the other guy gets. So, so defecting is, in other words, decision maker one, if he defects, he knows he's going to get a reward of one. He's going to get the hair. But if he cooperates, he doesn't know if he's going to get the stag or nothing. So cooperating is a risky strategy. Defecting is a riskless strategy. So you've got a Pareto optimal Nash equilibrium and a riskless Nash equilibrium. And so what, what is the smart thing for you to do? Well, the smart thing to do is cooperate. Everybody cooperate. Unless you're kind of risk averse decision maker, in which case you should defect. So the funny thing is, when you look at these games this way, there is, um, there's no easy answer. You know, it really depends on what the other person's going to do. You really have to, you, um, out with the other guy. The first game, the simple cooperation, there was something that, that uh, was good for the public, you know, good collectively, and it was good individually. In all these other ones, what's good individually may not be what's good for the collective. OK, so that's the, that's the stag hunt. Let's see if there's anything else I want to say about that. Nope. OK, one more game. And this is the emblematic game uh, that people talk about an awful lot. This is called The Prisoner's Dilemma. And it has a lot of parallels in, in quite a few of the things that we think about. So The Prisoner's Dilemma. Payoff looks like this. Uh, payoff can look like a lot of things, but let's, let's make it look like this. If both cooperate, they both get a reward of three, let's say on a scale of five. If they both defect, they get a one, let's say on a scale of five. If one cooperates and one defects, then the, is that right? This doesn't, maybe I've got these in the wrong order. Let me just think about this a second. Um, 
if you cooperate, yeah, okay, well, let, let's set up, so if, if you cooperate um, and the other person defects, right, then the cooperator is not rewarded, the defector is, okay, the defector is rewarded. So this is called the prisoner's dilemma because the idea is, suppose there are two guys that committed a crime together and they're arrested, the police don't have really good evidence for them. They put them in prison, but they're going through the trial, and the, the, the police are pressuring these guys to confess. Well, if, um, if they both confess, well, the, the possible prison term is five years, right? But if they both confess, then, um, then, then the police will say, okay, you guys owned up to it, that's fine. We'll, uh, we'll just give you a two-year sentence. So they're gaining back, they're each gaining back three years of their life, okay? If they both um, defect, that, de that is, don't confess, then the police don't have a strong case, but they're still going to convict them, and they'll get four years in prison time. So um, by, by both defecting, they've gained themselves, you know, one year. I'm putting this as gain, so this is not the number of years in prison, it's the number of years not in prison, okay? Um, but if one confesses, then the confessor goes to jail for five years, and the defector gets off scot-free. Okay. So, um, so what is the so what is uh, what happens here? Well, if you knew that your if if decision maker one knew that decision maker two was going to defect, if you knew it was in this column, what would you do? Well, you would. You would defect as well, right? Because uh, think of these as payoffs now. You would rather one over zero. So if you knew this person was going to defect, you would defect as well. Likewise, uh, the, there's symmetry there. If, if decision maker two that knew that decision maker one was going to defect, he would defect. What if decision maker one knew that decision maker two was going to cooperate? So you're in this column now. What would decision maker one do? Well, the optimal thing to do is still to defect. Right? It's better to defect because I'll end up with a, you know, a gain of five rather than a gain of three. And likewise, um, this person's motivated to defect. So the interesting thing is there's a Nash equilibrium. It's a terrible Nash equilibrium because everybody does really pretty badly. Um, so the Nash equilibrium is, forces everybody to do badly. So if you're trying to think what the other person's going to do, you should defect. Whatever you think they're going to do, you should defect. But the interesting thing is, everybody would be happier. You could improve everybody's outcome if both people cooperate. Okay, so that's why this is, this is not, um, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's an optimal solution here that's better than this Nash equilibrium, there's a solution that's better than this Nash equilibrium. But the funny thing is about this solution, it's very unstable. If, if, uh, if you were talking to, if you were communicating, and you could convince the other decision maker to cooperate, thinking that you were gonna cooperate, the smartest thing for you is to defect. So, but they're gonna think you're gonna do that, and so they're gonna defect as well, and so you end up right back in the same place. Um, so this is a very, very troubling game, and incidentally, take a look at the multi-criteria decision analysis that we started out with, all right? Uh, the multi-criteria decision analysis we started out with has ex A, B, C, and D are the four cells of the prisoner's dilemma. The payoffs are the payoffs for um, decision maker one and decision maker two, and they're just rescaled. And so interestingly, what we find by doing a prisoner's dilemma analysis is that alternative D is a Nash equilibrium. Well, we eliminated alternative D right off the bat. We said alternative D is dominated by A. We would never, there's no circumstance under which we would choose alternative D if we were cooperating in a consensus kind of way. And yet it's the Nash equilibrium for this problem when you think about this as competing, competing uh, uh, decision makers. And so, um, so this is what's so troubling about this problem is there is a solution that is best collectively. It's certainly best in the, it, the collective good, right? So if you look at the sum, the sum total 
of, of payoffs. It's six for the cooperate, cooperate, and it's only five for the cooperate, detect. So the public at large or, or the, um, the decision makers collectively are better off collectively if they both cooperate, and yet it's in their individual interests to cheat. All right, and that and that is the that's the essence, you know, really of the of the game theory, and that's why the prisoner's dilemma, which also goes by a lot of other names, it goes by the name of the free rider problem, and um, also the um, the tragedy of the commons. I'll come to that uh, in a second. But there's something about this game that describes the problem that we face when we've got competing decision makers, and where the game is structured in such a way. Um, that it leads everybody to a, a dominated alternative, that the, mo the individual motivations lead to something that actually is um, a pretty bad solution. So, okay. So that's, that's a little bit of, of game theory, just an introduction to the, these kind of things. Now, the, the, the idea of this is that if you can understand the structure of the game, it's important to understand the structure of the game and what these payoffs are, because it gives you insight into how the decision makers might act. And it also, as I'll talk about in a little while, gives you insight into how you might get out of these games. These are not good games to be in, right? It's not fun to be in the pr prisoner's dilemma. We don't want to be in these kind of games. And so the question is, is there a way, one of the questions is, you know, how do, how do we deal with that? Can we get out of these games? OK. so. Um, so let's, let's talk about this. So can we view conservation decisions as games? And why would we want to? Well, the first thing is, if we can view conservation decisions, environmental decisions, natural resource decisions, decisions about the climate, these kind of collective social decisions as games, may, why would we do that? Well, it might help us discover solutions. There's a lot of this game theory that, that suggests ways that you might um, get out of these games or fix these games so that uh, that you motivate the better behavior. In The Prisoner's Dilemma, how do you motivate people to cooperate when it's not in their individual interest to cooperate? The other thing is by clarifying the structure of the game and understanding what's going on, it might provide insight. So let's, let's think of some examples. Think about transboundary management of, say, an endangered species or some other kind of natural resource. So, OK, so you've got the US and Canada, let's say that are managing a resource that, that crosses the boundary. That description, any of the games that I showed you, the cooperative game, the chicken game, the stag hunt game, the prisoner's dilemma game, it could be that that transboundary management falls into any one of them. So for example, how could it be a game of chicken? Well, let's suppose that, let's suppose you talk about endangered species and there's a joint recovery or conservation plan that, that these two countries have agreed to. So you've got a joint conservation plan these two, these two countries have agreed to. If they both um, cooperate, uh, that's fine. But there is some benefit, um, even if they don't co both cooperate, the, um, they would have both have to pay in. You know, they both have to do some expenditures to cooperate and implement this plan. And if they do, then, then things are good. But if one of them implements the plan and the other doesn't, it's still good for the species, right? And the one that defected doesn't pay the costs. So that's even better. It's a win-win. That's, that's it's, it's great for them. They get the benefit of the endangered species objective, and they don't have to bear the costs. The other person thinks the same thing. And so, um, but if, obviously, if they don't, and if neither cooperates, then, then the, the endangered species is lost. All right, so that, that is exactly the structure of the game of chicken. Um, so, um, you know, anyway, if you understood it that way, then you could, you could think about that, that management problem, that competitive management problem in that way. Use, use the game theory to help you find a solution. Or the game might be structured as a stag hunt, for instance. Um, if, um, if unilateral defection with, uh, so let's say, let's say um, you could both cooperate. That would be great. That's, that's the best for the species. Or you could implement a local management program that, that helps the species in your area but doesn't in the other area. 
And the things that the other person has to do, if they cooperate and you defect, you implement your local management, you're okay. But all they've done, they've cooperated and done these sort of grandiose things, but you haven't reciprocated in those kind of things, and so there's no payoff for them. Um, and then if you both defect, then you both actually maintain things a little bit locally, all right? So you both chase the hair, you both have something to show for it. So that's interesting, that's a stag hunt thing. Well, it matters whether it's a chicken, a game of chicken, or a stag hunt game. The strategy matters, and understanding what your competitor's gonna do uh, matters in those, in those settings. So, um, okay, so transboundary management of endangered species is, um, you know, we might use these kind of this game theory to, uh, to understand that. Let's talk now about the tragedy of the commons. There's, um, there's often, uh, we talk a lot about tragedy of the commons. Wait, I see I've got a question. Yeah, Brady. Is the Nash equilibrium equivalent to an evolutionary, ev evolutionarily stable strategy? Yes, right, so um, the, that's a good question. Behavioral ecologists and evolutionary ecologists have used game theory to understand how species interact. They've under, to understand an awful lot about behavior of individuals and the evolution of behavior of individuals. So yeah, so Nash equilibrium is an evolutionary stable strategy. And so uh, there, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of interesting theory in, in ecology, behavioral ecology and evolutionary ecology that uses game theory to understand you know, why, why things are the way they are. So you can think of um, predator-prey dynamics. You can think about um, mate competition dynamics uh, in, in a lot of these same kind of ways. Yep. Are there other questions while, while we're paused here? Brady? One more question. Yeah, so to defect in the prisoner's dilemma here means to rat out the other prisoner, and cooperate means to stay silent? Yeah, in the prisoner's dilemma, in that analogy, uh, cooperating means confessing, okay? If you both confess, um, then, if you both confess, then they're going to give you a lesser sentence, right? If you both deny it, so defecting is denying, um, they're going to give you a longer sentence, so your payoff is lower, right? But if one confesses and one denies, then the confessor gains, the denier, um, is that right? Yeah. The, if one confesses, the denier gains, right? If one confesses, the, de deny, the, the one that denies it goes free and the confessor goes to jail for the full term, right? So, um, yeah, is that, is that okay? Thanks. Other questions? Okay. Um, the point here is, if we can show everybody that it's in their best interest to cooperate, then maybe they, w maybe we'll get a better solution for all. Well, that's an interesting question. You'd think that, um, but if you look at the prisoner's dilemma chart, you can show everybody this, and and say, look, the best, the best interest overall, you know, for the collective good is for for everybody to cooperate, but. But if I knew everybody, if I knew the other person was going to cooperate, I'd cheat, right? So even knowing the structure of this, you could tell people that, but, but they would still, you know, you're still motivated. If you thought everybody was going to play, play here, then, then, then you, should go, you should defect because you can, you know, you can gain for, so, so the, it would be nice, you know, if all you had to do was display the problem and the solution became evident. That's what we hope for. That's what we try to do in these. That's, that would be a, a dominating alternative, right, if you, if you finally show everybody. Um, I think in the stag hunt, it's a little more interesting. So the stag hunt is a little more interesting because you can show people that. And if they trust the other person, then they should, um, then, then you, everybody should seek the best solution. But the prisoner's dilemma is worse because even knowing this, you're motivated individually to cheat, um, and, that, and that's the problem. And so that leads not to this problem of the tragedy of the commons, okay? So the tragedy of the commons is sort of a multiplayer prisoner's dilemma. So say you've got this same sort of thing going on, but now instead of two people playing, you've got 100 people playing. And um, 
So what you have is, uh, so the example for, for natural resource management is there's, there's some common pool natural resource that's available for consumption um, from which it's difficult to exclude users. So think of fishing grounds, forests, wild populations of animals, wetlands, grazing grounds, all these kind of things. And, and the example is, um, okay, I'm getting a request to label the activity that represents it defect and cooperate on the board? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, the, uh, oh, I see, for the particular examples. Okay, so in the, so, okay, I'll do that. In the case of the tragedy of the commons, the, um, suppose you're, okay, so you're managing, you're managing a commons. Everybody could harvest sustainably, right? So if you're decision maker one, you could choose to harvest, uh, to, to, uh, rem you know, to take from this commons, if it's a wild population, to hunt it sustainably or fish it. Sustain Let's do fishing, okay? So uh, I could choose to fish in a sustainable manner. Um, that is, I could follow, you know, nice rules. There's no, let's say there's no laws here, but there's some suggestions that everybody should do hand line fishing and should stop at a certain number, okay? Or I could go over quota, or over the suggested quota. Um, you know, li likewise, decision maker two could fish sustain, could choose to fish sustainably. Again, I'm not saying here that there is a requirement to do so. There's no law here. It's not regulated. This is unregulated fishery. But still, as a decision maker, I could choose to act in a way to only harvest you know, a, a share that I think is going to be sustainable, um, or I could go over quota. So um, what happens? Well, look, if I think everybody else is going to be fishing sustainably, um, the, the payoffs aren't quite exactly right for this problem. This is a little bit more of a free rider problem. But um, the um, if I go over my quota, I get the five, maybe everybody else still gets the three or 2.9 or something like that. Um, the, this, basically, I'm one of 100 people fishing. If I go over my quota, I'm not going to single-handedly wipe out this resource. It'll still be around. It'll still be managed sustainably. I get a little extra bit. That's OK. So if I know everybody else is going to cooperate, if everybody else is going to pay their bus fare, I don't have to pay mine. You know, Buses will still keep running. That 50 cents isn't going to make or break things, or 250, whatever it is. Um, so you know, if I jump the style on the subway, and it's just me, subway's still around. It's OK, right? Um, but if everybody goes over quota, if everybody fails to pay their bus fare, if it's a voluntary bus fare, if everybody jumps the style in the uh, subway, then you overfish the fishery. The fishery's gone. The bus system. The city can't manage, manage the bus system or the subway system or, or what have you. And so, so, the, um, so the prisoner's dilemma, which is the two-person version of this game, the, um, is the same as the free rider conundrum and the um, tragedy of the commons. And I, you know, look, I have to say, I lived in Australia um, for a while, and the the sub the tram system is is excellent in Melbourne, and it's um, you know you pay a fare, but there's no conductor on the tram, so there's nobody taking your ticket. So you can you, you can cheat, you know. Um, it's really easy to ride that for free. And I have to confess, there were days when I was rushing to work and I didn't have the right amount in my pocket. And I was just like, ah, oh, ride for free. Um, there was enforcement occasionally. I saw it happen once in the year that I was there. And so I was like, you know, I was actually making this decision. I, I, I'm, I shouldn't admit to this, you know, on, <laughs> on camera when it's being broadcast. But um, I was going, OK, what's the probability? of, um, I was actually doing this from a risk analysis, you know, what's the probability that I'm going to get caught? How many times do, could I ride free to pay off what the fine is? So I wanted to know what the fine was. Well, you can't exactly go up and ask the conductor, by the way, what's the fine for, uh... 
anyway, but the point is, this is the, these problems are real. We face them every day in a lot of different contexts, um, and, they, and they create these real difficulties. OK, so, um, so the tragedy of the commons. See, the best thing to do is for everybody to manage sustainably, right? Um, that's the best for everyone. But when that's the case, there's individual incentive to cheat. And that's the problem with the uh, prisoner's dilemma. The point here is that if we start to understand our natural resource management problems as games, we begin to understand what these hidden motivations are and why it is that we never seem to achieve what we hope to achieve. So the question is, how can we solve these things? How do we, how, if we're faced with a prisoner's dilemma, how do we deal with it? One thing people talk about is, well, we just got to do education. We've got to change people's attitudes. We've got to get them to value the collective good a little bit over the public good. So if you look at the prisoner's dilemma problem the way I've drawn it, the, if, if people start thinking about this in terms of the collective good, if we draw in here the collective um, value, 6, 5, 5, 2, then this is a no-brainer, right? There's, there's no question that the best thing to do from the collective side of things is for everybody to cooperate. If you write it that way, so, but that in, involves inducing an ethic of the public good. That's successful sometimes. That's successful. There are societies that are able to induce this ethic of the collective good and sol get themselves out of a um, prisoner's dilemma problem. The, the difficulty is, though, the problem with that is um, it's really hard. Uh, you've got that ethic, and the, the more you instill that ethic, right, and the more you know people are going to cooperate, then as an individual, the more optimal it is for you to cheat, right? Um, so, so this motivation, the motivation to cheat still exists. So the other thing to do, the other thing, and we do this a lot, is we change the reward structure. And this is a really critical point. If you know you're caught in this kind of game, change the reward structure so it's not a prisoner's dilemma anymore. Change the reward structure into a, into a simple cooperative game. Well, how could we do this? Well, one thing we could do is, let me just uh, erase a little bit of this detail here so we can um, get back to the, the problem at hand. Um, so here was a prisoner's dilemma. Had a Nash equilibrium in a very, very bad place. Let's suppose that what I did was I, I'm going to induce some enforcement. And if you cheat, there, you're going to get caught. It's really good enforcement. If you cheat, you're going to get caught. It's really good enforcement. And you're going to be penalized three points. All right. So if you defect now, the person who defects is penalized two point, three points. So this now means um, if decision maker one cooperates and decision maker two defects, they get a payoff of two. Likewise, if decision maker two cooperates and decision maker one defects, they get a payoff of two. If both defect, they both get a payoff of negative two. Well, now what happens? Let's reanalyze this game. Uh, if if I defect, so basically, you know, you're saying there is, you're going to be penalized if you defect. There's some overarching uh, enforcer who's going to detect defection and punish it. Then, um, then what happens? If I knew this guy was going to defect, what would I do? I would, this is better for me, I would cooperate. Um, likewise, if he knew I was going to defect, he'd cooperate. If I knew he was going to cooperate, oh, I like the three better than the two, I would cooperate, and so would he. Well, now we've got a Nash equilibrium and a Pareto optimal solution in exactly the place that's good for the public, the collective good. So what we've done is we've motivated, we've turned a game that was a prisoner's dilemma into a game that's a simple cooperative game by changing the reward structure. And we do this all the time. This is why we have government, right? We have government to put incentives in, um, you know, this, um, all the kind of incentives we have for conservation efforts, all the, and, and or when we have uh, tariffs or punitive sorts of things that are meant to induce certain kinds of behavior. Essentially what you're doing is you're changing the reward structure of a game to induce the solution 
that uh, to, to, take the, to make the solution that's best for the public collectively, the Nash equilibrium that's also Pareto optimal. So that's, uh, that's the power then of understanding these things as, as games and understanding the structure of the games because then you can say, well, how might we change these games to get the outcome that we think is best for the public? So we impose sanctions, reprisals, individual limits, quotas, incentives, uh, all those kinds of things. The trick is this requires effective enforcement. There was enforcement on the Melbourne tram lines. It was a low level of enforcement. It wasn't, uh, maybe it was in fact effective enough. You actually don't have to have 100% um, enforcement. You have to have enough enforcement that, um, that indu it induces the cooperative behavior enough of the time that the, that the system is sustained. So, okay. So that's one of, so one of the so one of the solutions is to change people's attitudes, change the ethics around the situation. Another is to induce uh, a change through changing the reward structure. The other issue here is is a lot of times there's um, issues of communication, negotiation, and trust. If we can communicate this stuff, if we can negotiate, and if I can trust what you're going to do, if we can build trust, and if you can indicate to me that you're committed to trust uh, to cooperate. Then, then that'll work too. And so sometimes what we do is um, people in this kind of situation will, knowing that they want to get to this upper solution, will indicate to the other person in a way that convinces them you're committed that they can trust you, that you're going to cooperate. The burn your bridges strategy some, in some ways um, is, if, is a good indication to somebody. That, that the analogy doesn't quite hold. But basically, if you, if you take some action that's irreversible, that shows that you're going to cooperate, then that's an indication to the other person to cooperate as well. And so, um, so there's, um, you know, there's, there's those kind of things. The final thing I want to, I want to say is, and we're running out of time here, so I'm not going to get to all my comments, but um, when games are repeated, there's a whole new dynamic that arises. When games are repeated, what happens is you can monitor the trust that you've placed in your opponent. Because there's a feedback loop. If they cheat, you know it one round. You, can, you have the chance for reprisal later. So, there is, um, so these repeated games actually induce a very different kind of behavior. Because um, today's game has ramifications for tomorrow's game. Uh, one of the things that comes out of this is if you have a repeated pr prisoner's dilemma game, one strategy that is actually almost optimal is a uh, tit-for-tat strategy, which says, Start out cooperating, and then do whatever the other person did in the previous round. So if they cooperate the previous round, then you cooperate again, um, and so on. And uh, if they're doing the same thing, that's great. Everybody ends up cooperating. But if they cheat, you turn around and cheat the next time, um, just as, as sort of a punishment you know, for them to, to remind them, you look, I'm not going to put up with this kind of behavior. Now, the one thing that does is that does possibly lead you into um, this sort of, this sort of uh, situation where everybody's just cheating the whole time because that's what the last person did on the last term. You just you know, drive yourself into the spiral. So there is a slightly more uh, effective strategy, which is cooperate at first, and then if somebody um, cheats while you cooperated, then you cheat the next time, or you, you give a reprisal. But if both people are doing a, a reprisal, then why don't you co cooperate on the next turn? Because it allows yourself to get out of that. Uh, anyway, so the interesting thing is the game theorists have found these sort of fascinating solutions that are actually fairly simple solutions when these games are repeated. Um, and, and so that, you know, that's an important thing to understand. And a lot of these games are repeated. Uh, the, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the times, these are just not single, single opportunities. OK. Well, I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, the, um, there is an, a whole lot of other interesting topics uh, that are captured in game theory. We've only scratched the surface. One of the interesting questions I'll leave you with, and I won't answer it, you can mull it over, is, is what does value of information mean in a game theoretic context? Um, who, is it valuable to learn, learn about the behavior of the uh, other people, learn about the structure of the game, learn about the payoffs, um, or is it possible that that there are times when there's a negative value of information. With that, um, thanks. I, I guess we're out of time for questions. And so what we'll do is we'll reconvene um, later. The 
for today, the folks who are online can call into the WebEx and we'll have, we'll have questions uh, from the classroom. Thanks very much for your attention.